Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this beautiful series, The Embrace. This is the Youth Week of Prayer, live here from Lovington. And we have been getting very uplifting and nice lessons by and by. Today, I'm happy that you could join me on this lesson. What is the title of our lesson today? Our lesson today is titled Restoring Relationships. Restoring Relationships. Well, this is a good lesson. We would like to ask you to call a friend or share the link with a friend and sit with us and let's enjoy this lesson together. Maybe before we do, we could pause for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for today. Thank you for life. Thank you for relationships. We thank you because you can help us to restore these relationships by your power. So as we go through this lesson, open our minds to understand your will and help us to do it, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You see, today we see a lot of quarrels and fights in family. Marriages are being broken down and people have actually quarantined themselves from families and from relationships. Indeed, social distancing as a concept is one that has existed way before the word became known to us. Okay. Because many people have been socially distancing themselves from the social and moral institution of marriage one, and relationships. One great writer actually said never speak of marriage as an achievement. And well, she has her own reasons why to say that, but we like to notice how marriage and relationships form a huge subject for every department of life today, including health. Now, ma marriage is based on love. Mm -hmm. Is that true? That is very true. You know, I was doing some study and I found out that there are six benefits of love. Could you check if you can benefit from any of these? What are those benefits? That love can, can empower your mind. When well, in love, you know, it empowers you to think positive thoughts and you start doing good things. And number two, love is also a natural painkiller. You should tell me about that. <laughs> that when you're in love, you actually experience a positive release of hormones which make you feel good or feel good hormones if oh. you like. And these feel good hormones help to reduce your feeling of pain. Okay. In fact, that is why hospitals allow their loved ones to go visit. Except 
adapt during difficult times such as this? Well, now when you are quarantined, it, it's hard. Love also helps your body to fight illness. I also don't know how that happens. You can tell me about that. The same thing that when your mind is in a positive state, your body consequently goes into the same state and you are positively enabled mm -hmm. to fight disease. So right now you need to be more in love if you want to fight disease. Uh -huh. <laughs> I also found out that li love enhances longevity. You know, when you're in love, you actually make good choices of food, even for the sake of your children. You don't go in risky and love also insomnia. In that actually lack of of sleep. So when you love, you usually will sleep well unless it is fine love. And then it also helps you on a spiritual level. There's a quotation here. I would like you to read it. It's from a book called Letters to Young Lovers, page 8. It says, I love you. How special are those words between two young people, but even more wonderful they become when spoken to us by our sister, who wants to be happy and find joy in our relationship with each other. So God desires that we should have joy and uh, happiness in our relationships. In fact, God provides love because he knows that love is actually a basic need. Well, I agree with you because love helps us to, you know, give it love gives us a sense of belonging and a sense of importance that is very necessary for development. People who develop well, people who even do well, children who do well in school, are those who have security, who have mutual respect. And then why then should we be in relationships, especially during this time? There are at least four reasons why you need relationships or why God created relationships. And number one, it provides for humans basic needs needs. We read from the book Adventist home page 26. It says marriage which encapsules love, relationship, family. It says this is a blessing. Why? It guards the purity and happiness of a race. It provides for man's social needs. It elevates the physical, the intellectual, and the moral nature. Why else should we be in relationships? Well, the other reason, the second reason is to learn. In a relationship, we learn responsibility and commitment. Well, that means when we see a society where people are not committed, there must be something going wrong with relationship or marriage or family. An attack on love and marriage and relationship will produce an irresponsible society that is in disarray. Actually, one writer says in Adventist Home, one more time, the book we're reading, page 327, it says it was Satan's studied effort to pervert the marriage institution, to weaken its obligations and lessen its sacredness. For in no surer way could he deface the image of God in man and open the door to misery and vice. I like the sentence of weaken the obligation of the marriage institution. You know, today, the people divorce for every kind of reason. I had a divorce where a husband divorced his wife because their pets were not agreeing. <laughs> and you or, know, or the other one where one was divorced because he was, the husband was snoring. He was snoring. Those are flimsy reasons. And women today also wonder why men can't just be committed. But you know, this uncommitted, irresponsible behavior is produced when people make a joke of marriage. In fact, marriage, love, relationship, and family is not just a good idea, but it's a good idea. It's not a that man made along the way to learn how to deal with child and parental issues. Marriage, love, and relationship is a God idea. And so perhaps the other reason why relationships, why marriage, is we need to enhance God's agenda mm -hmm. in our homes. In Genesis 1 verse 28, the Bible says, And God blessed them, that is Adam and Eve, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion. 
And we can see God's agenda in that text. I don't know if you can see it. God making man in his own image. Mm -hmm. He wanted man to enjoy the same way he enjoys. He wanted man to have dominion. He wanted man to rule, to be fruitful. And he wanted man to be blessed. God has an agenda, friends. Having created man, he wanted them to rule. And the best place where there is a microcosm of rulership, of dominion, of blessing, of fruitfulness is in the home. That's why he told Abraham, of old in Genesis 28 verse 14 if you could read for us that promise it says and in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed so God has an agenda to bless us through family and that's why we come to the fourth point for today why relationships relationship relation for society and organization it is not the national government it is not our school it is not you know, the different enlarged societies where we live, but family is actually the foundation of the entire country. So you are saying before there was school, before there was government, even before there was church, there was a family. Yes. So marriage, family, love, relationship precedes all other institutions. It's like the foundation, if you should say. No wonder I remember Jesus talking, giving a parable of the man who built his uh, house upon the, 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 the rock. He said it's like a man without a foundation. That's the one who built on the sand. And he built his house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. You know, today, when you see the society collapsing, I feel and I'm sure that the, society, the family has collapsed. And that's why David asks in Psalms 11 verse 3, if you could read for us that question. It says, if the foundation destroyed... Can the rights do? What can the rights do? Mm -hmm. What will God's children do when the foundations like marriage and family are being destroyed? And that's why today we brought in this subject of rebuilding relationship. Rebuilding relationship. And we would like to follow a story. You are telling me about a story in the morning. Yes, that's the story of Abraham in ah. Genesis 24 verse 2. Mm. This is the story of Abraham thinking about his son and the future of his son when it comes to matters of family. The Bible says in verse 2 that Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. In ancient times, marriages were engaged by their parents. But that, that custom, I think in some places it's there. But it doesn't mean that you were supposed to la uh, marry someone who you don't love. None was required to marry somebody they couldn't love. But in bestowing their affection to parental wisdom, the young were allowing the old people to guide them if they had God-fearing parents. And so, you know, it was regarded as honor to the parent when you deferred your choices to them. So in verse 2, we see Abraham calling his eldest servant. And he says this in Genesis chapter 2, chapter 24, verse 2, he says, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, mm. and I will make thee swear by the Lord that you shall not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites. You know why they were swearing by the thigh? Because the thigh was the point where it was a sign of progenity that there would be a succession and the blessings that were given to Abraham would be handed over and that this was also a matter of importance. But the swearing here was... Uh, uh, Eliezer was to swear that he would not take a daughter from where? From the Canaanite daughters. What was wrong with the Canaanite daughters? There are at least three reasons why the Canaanites were not to be married with Isaac or to be mingled. Number one. First is that they were different from Isaac. Isaac was raised differently, and mm. so his belief system and the Canaanite daughter's belief system would have been totally different. What's the second reason? The second reason is that because they are different, the Canaanite daughters were to be a bad influence to Isaac. To Isaac. Isaac had been raised up in virtue, and the others had been raised in vice. And where virtue and vice meet, oftentimes vice wins over virtue. And the last reason is 
these Canaanites were going to be destroyed in a short while. Abraham was told in holy vision that 400 years your descendants will be in Egypt. And when they come back, the first people to be destroyed would be Canaanites. And that's why the Bible warns when it comes to marriage. If we would rebuild homes, the first step is to make correct choices. And Paul tells us of the best choice. In 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14, the Bible says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Mm. And who are unbelievers? Unbelievers are people who don't believe as you believe. And the servants, uh, you know now, they are making a conversation here. And the servant is asking um, Abraham, if this woman does not want to come with me, I'm willing to go, I have sworn. If this woman is not willing to come with me to this land, if that happens, should I take uh, Isaac to Canaan? And the, the answer comes in verse 6. And I want you to read what Abraham tells in Eliezer. Verse six says, Abraham said, no, don't take my son to that place. That means do not go. And he invokes a blessing. Abraham invokes a blessing that I would like every young man to put at heart. Genesis 24 verse 7. And he said unto me, The Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with thee and will prosper, prosper thy way. And thou shalt take a wife for my son of my kindred and of my father's house. You know, friends, does this... Uh, blessings still apply today? Oh yes, it applies to us today. There are so many people today who have given up in God giving them a partner or a life partner mm. who believes as they do. Yeah, and they... that's an important point that sometimes you might be married off to someone who does not believe like you do. For example, if someone believes that having sex before marriage is wrong, the other one believes that it's quite okay, the two or one of you is an unbeliever, isn't it? That's true. Yeah. If you don't believe the same thing, then you are an unbeliever. Yeah. And so we have three, again, points uh, as we trail this story. How to restore relationship. Number one, we see in the story of Isaac and Abraham a, 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 a bid towards participation. And there are people who are participating here. We can see Abraham is participating. The older servant is, is participating. They involve God and there is a partnership in it. And so any young person who wants to restore res relationship, anybody who wants to restore their own relationship, they need to involve people who are of help to them. And we see the people who are actually involved. One of the people is God mm. because Abraham speaks that God is going to prosper the way of his servant. The other one is God-fearing parents. A lot of times as young people, we would want to quarantine our parents ah, away from, from our decisions concerning marriage and relationships. That's why there is this quotation from Letters to Young Lovers. It says, T take God and... Your God fearing parent to you, your kind young friend, and then pray over the matter. In fact, in page in the same book, it says, If there was a subject that needed to be viewed from every standpoint, you know, that means view it from a bird's eye view, view it from a, a worm's eye view, which other view do you know? A side view, and it is this marriage. The aid of the experience of others and a calm, careful weighing of the matter on both sides is positively essential. So there's another courtship partner there you can see, or a marriage partner. It's called experienced faithful. Not only that, we see not just that when you have people around you, you will benefit from a few things. What are those things? You benefit from accountability, right. good advice, purity and approval. All right. And then there's the last thing I would like you to add in your relationship. It is called good common sense. <laughs> in fact, I pick it from the same book, the same page, Letters to Young Lovers, page 45. It says, good common sense is needed here. That means in marriage. If you go to marriage without common sense, <laughs> Let me not say what will happen to you. But the fact is, most of the time, people don't even apply common sense. And so we move on. In restoring relationship, apart from participation, where you want to involve people, the right people, don't just involve, you know, there are people who just involve their age mates. No, you want to involve the whole world. You'll even post it on oh, Facebook. Oh, there are also people who involve <laughs> everybody. Yeah. 
But I don't think that's the kind of involvement we want here. We want a partnership of people who are experienced. People will give you good advice. People will counsel you, God, the Bible, and God-fearing parents. And when we move to point number two, we also see that you need to depend on providence. And here we see Isaac, uh, sorry, the servant of, uh, of um, what? Eliezer. This guy is called Eliezer. He was a servant of Abraham. Yes. In Genesis 24, verse 6, I want you to read that, uh, that text. The Bible says, And the servant took ten camels Aha. of the camels of his master yes. and departed, for all the goods of his master were in his hand. Mm. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, the city of Naho. You know, these camels were to be used for his own company and also for the bridal party in return. Some were gifts that he was going to give. Is it biblical to give bride price. You know, some uh, nations, actually, it is the women who pay bride price. I think I should be part of that <laughs> that community. <laughs> but I paid bride price, didn't I? Yes, you did. Was it a lot of money? No, I think the concept of bride price, as you see from Eliezer, he is carrying something with him. It's always good to come with something yeah. in your hand. Actually, the Bible says that bride price was taken or was given to show that the son was able to take care of the girl that he was, ta he was taking for over from his father because the father is the one who would care for the girl. But notice the girl's family did not dictate. There was no bargaining or mm. selling. You know, there are cultures to Today, who actually say bride price is going to be 10 million. If you can't get 10 million, get out of here. I don't think that is very biblical. And uh, when we move forward, we see this guy. He actually kneels down and prays. You want to read for us his prayer in verse 12? He says, Lord, please show your kindness to my master by helping me find a wife for his son Isaac. In fact, in the prayer, if you read on, he tells God the kind of things he wants in that woman. He says, give me qualities of kindness, an amiable, modest, good heart, a woman who is able to serve, who has a large heart. And soon after that prayer, remember, he didn't pray and ask God, give me a wife that has figure 10. Look at the lady that shows up. You want to read that in verse 16? <laughs> in verse 16, the Bible says she was very pretty. Who is that? Which lady is that? That is Rebecca. Rebecca. She was a virgin. No man had ever had sexual relations with her. She went down to the well and filled her jar. We see Rebecca coming out in answer to this divine prayer. A beautiful, very, when the Bible says you are very pretty, that's very serious. Mm -hmm. But did uh, Eliezer ask for a pretty woman? No, he just asked for a woman who was willing to serve. Exactly. So God knows that we need pretty women for wives. Mm -hmm. And so we need to make our prayers stable on God's word. And when Rebecca came with her jar on the shoulder, she quickly lowered the jar from her shoulder and gave drink, you know, to the camels. And then quickly she was running all over and she was getting water for the camel and making this guy's drink and the other people there. And I was just thinking, what did did Eliezer do? Did he begin speaking? No, Eliezer actually just watched her. Hey. You know, some men actually speak too early. The Bible says in Genesis 24 verse 21, the servant quietly watched her. He wanted to be sure that the Lord had given him an answer and had made his trip successful. That the man did not uh, speak too fast? Mm -hmm. are, are you saying there are some men who speak too fast? Yes. But there's also an advantage here we see of a woman or a man being found in the path of duty. You know, there are some young men who have resigned from uh, life. They are, all they are doing is looking for relationship. They are just wondering, could it be this one? Could it be the next one? No, friends, God is going to find you in the course of duty. And provision for your home is going to come as you keep doing every day's thing, as you keep serving, as you keep uh, uh, supplying. What is the first question that Eliezer asked this woman? The first question that Eliezer asked her is found in Genesis 24, verse 23. It mm. says, the servant asked, who is your father? Oh, the servant didn't ask, uh, you look similar. <laughs> <laughs> 
Or are you taken? Or are you? Well, there is somewhere there in the question, there is a, a, an insinuation. He wanted to know. You could read the last part of the verse. He asked, and is there a place yeah. in your father's house for me and my men to sleep? I think he was just asking, is there a space in your heart? Can I initiate a conversation of you, marriage? You know what I like about this question is that the first thing he asks is who is your father exactly and men need to be afraid especially when you have a woman whose father is god and women need to be afraid especially if you have a man whose father is god <laughs> you are very right <laughs> right yeah. because you know the jews i told you about that story the jews would never step on a piece of paper mm -hmm. because according to them maybe the piece of paper had the name of god written in it mm -hmm. And they wouldn't step on the name of God. True. And sometimes we meet people around and we treat them like trash. We step on them not knowing could be the name of God. In fact, not could be. I am very sure on everybody's face is imprinted the image and the name of God. Amen. So we need to treat carefully those who we find. Mm -hmm. We see Abraham's servant depending on God's providence. He relies on the promise of God and he prays. Let's move forward to the last point for today. We also see a preparedness in this woman. We're going to read that later. But maybe before we talk about preparedness, let's ask the question. Are there certain things that destroy a man's readiness for marriage? Yes, there are a few things that destroy a man's readiness for marriage. One mm. of the things is fatherlessness. Um, Maybe I can talk a, a little bit about it. Today, our world is a God society. The father is actually a father in heaven, but there is a daddy Christ. There is no mentor. There is no training for young boys. And they are running into identity crisis and all manner of crisis. It's a big issue affecting the world. And then there is also engaging in reckless behavior. Mm. Men are more likely to speed on the roads to recklessly on more And then there that destroys them is stress. Because even when they are stressed, they hardly speak They don't about say. Or work related. Some of them are relationship related. Stress is something that destroys men's readiness. And then there is idleness and bad company. Sports. And you know, men, I believe, were built for work. And work is different from a job. Men were built to be doing something. When men resign to doing nothing and just following the screen, it destroys them. Then the last thing there is purposelessness. No wonder one writer puts it this way in a book called Education, page 57. You want to read it that says, quote? The greatest want of the world is the want of men. Many men are needed today, yet men are not there and not ready. But something else, there are also things that threaten ladies' preparedness. You want to take us through that as well? Yes. Um, one of the things that threatens a lady is just the environment. Mm. And by and I mean physical environment, yeah. social environment. Why do they spend time? Because whatever you in, that is what you produce. Yeah, you know, ladies are more incubators. Whatever they listen to, I have often said, don't tell a lady your secret. <laughs> because they will not be quiet with it. It will just eat her. Whatever you give a woman, she will soon give it out. If you go hiding, you give them a spam, they will multiply the spam and a child will show up that looks like you. If you give them a word, they multiply it, they give you a sentence. If you give them a sentence, they multiply it and give you a paragraph. If you talk too much like me, my wife has multiplied my words and has given the world books. <laughs> so something else, that's why women need to be careful what they watch, isn't it? Yes. The third thing that destroys women is abuse, yeah? That you could be in an environment of abuse yeah. in your relationship, or you could have been abused as a child, and it is now affecting your thought process and the choices mm. that you're making now, and you might need to reconcile yourself with the past and with God and begin afresh. And you are telling me there are certain reasons why women are mostly abused sexually. What are some of those reasons? Some of the reasons why women are abused is sometimes we are naive and are assuming mm. you know at home some women assume that ah he should know so the woman keeps working and working and working instead of just asking for help and the man is actually willing to help or well, some yeah. women not married they assume that when the man is your boyfriend they are going to marry you and so they go extra extents and they give up their purity that they should know once you have slept with a woman you should marry them no they will not 
you should let them know by your reserve, by your distance. And the other reason is that women are naturally giving oh, yeah. in nature. Mm. That we love giving. You know, we always give compliments. You find a woman standing with another lady, they'll be complimenting their hair, their shoes. But men, Are you saying men are not givers? Men love, <laughs> men love taking. Yeah, and competing. And you know. competing. A man yeah? will meet a man, another one and they start by abusing themselves. You and know. you see, for a man to give, <laughs> Men need incentives to give. The reason why they go to work is because at the end of work, there'll be a salary or mm. something, a name at the end of it. And Jesus actually knew that men were like that. Yes, he actually gave them a verse. He said, when he was speaking to a group of men, he told them, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, yeah, shaken together. Yeah, the men were so encouraged by you know, that text. That's a man's knew, text. Exactly, that for a man to give, he has to have an incentive. But I don't know whether that is true for you men out there, I think I'm going to distance myself from that a little bit, but there's truth in it, I would agree. Yeah. Well, friends, let's talk about the last thing that affects ladies. It's sometimes it's a choice of career, but let's talk about the mouth. Do Does a mouth affect a woman? <laughs> yes, whatever we say with our mouth, whatever oh. comes out of us, a lot of times destroys our homes, mm. our relationships, and discourages people around us, but also what we take in. You know, often times... Take in 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 terms of eating food yes and food mm. you'll find a lady is the one who's managing the kitchen and so they eat everything including the leftovers of the baby the leftovers of the husband and because they don't want to throw away the food they say ah, let me just eat and that gives them health problems later right. Well, I don't know if that is true for you out there but um, uh, we need to as women watch our mouth. And then now there are this uh, Eliezer guy, he's talked to this good woman who looks so ready, and now they have gone home. They've gone back to Rebecca's home. And you see, there's, there's something that I, I like that pointed out to Rebecca's readiness. Yes. And that was, she was found in service. On duty. On duty. And then the Bible says she was running. She was swift to do her work. Mm. Many of us today are lazy in how we execute our duty we are lazy and slow, and slow. slothful and in business true mm -hmm. and just waiting that God should bring a relationship from heaven to our plate and we will also eat it lazily well then they went home now this is Eliezer and his team and then the scene plays nicely where Eliezer now sits down and they want to serve him food and the Eliezer says no 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 before you serve me food I want to tell you why I'm here you know the story of that boy who went borrowing an axe, the neighbor who went borrowing an axe from the other neighbor, and they found the neighbors who were cooking, and the guy said, welcome uh, my neighbor, sit down, we are cooking. So this guy did not declare his interest of wanting the axe. And while there was, he was still waiting for food, another neighbor came, and he said, oh, I can see you are sitting together and talking. Me, I won't sit down, but just give me, help me with the axe I came borrowing there. Axe. The other neighbor who was sitting inside also said, oh, I also wanted the axe. I don't know if you were the other neighbor owning the axe. Who would you give the axe? The one who asked. Yes, yeah, sometimes it's good to declare your interest early as a young man. You hang around a woman, helping them to cook, helping them to carry water until you will carry water in their wedding. You need to ask. So Eliezer says, I am here to actually know whether you will give me a wife or not. And they call Rebecca, and this is now verse 58. And when Rebecca was asked, do you want to go with this man now? What did Rebecca say? Rebecca said, yes, I will go. Yes, I will go. This looks serious readiness. And Lord, uh, friends, this thing reminds me of the Lord Jesus Christ when he's going to come a second time. Are we going to be ready as his church? Rebecca went immediately. As much as he stood, it took some time to be prepared. There might be some time the youth might take to be prepared, but our homes need to be prepared for the second coming. That our sons, some says in 144 verse 2, that our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, and our daughters may be as condoms put after the seed of our palace. This is the way of restoring relationships. You know why we need to restore relationships? Mm -hmm. Today there's a lot of stress. In fact, I was showing you some statistics in the morning. Yes, that um, in the world today, over 50% of marriages end up in divorce. Mm. In the year 2016 alone, that's a year we got married, 
there are about 22,537 marriages contracted. That is just in our country alone. Yes. And how many of the 22,000 are divorced? There were 9,345 divorces in the same year. And, what, are, what about separation? And 10,842 divorces in the same year. It looks like everybody is uh, fighting and divorcing. I don't know who is left married. Exactly. So out of the 22,000, assuming that all of these were divorces and 20, separation, 1,000. Yeah, so only 2,000 are left married. Are left married. And we're not talking about and people who are fighting in their homes. Do people go through conflicts in their homes? People go through conflict, not just in marriage, but even prior to marriage. Any human being capable of thinking and expressing their opinions will one day get into <laughs> conflict someday. And that is why we want to finish this segment by telling you or sharing with you how to deal with conflict. You know, conflict has something that uh, to eat that is called anger. I don't know. Do you know something called anger? In fact, anger is one of the primary responses oh. that everyone experiences. Do you get angry? Yes, I do get angry. Mm. Is anger bad? No, anger is not bad. In fact, if you want to keep away from conflict, just stop thinking and stop expressing your opinion. You will never be at conflict. But if you are able to express your opinion, if you're able to think somewhere, somehow, even in a home setup, you are going to go two different ways. And there are two different uh, people in terms of how they uh, respond to anger. Some people are called intimidators. You know a guy like that? Yeah, intimidators are people who make you feel that they are angry. You made me angry, so you must pay. And then there are people who are called internalizers. I know one of them. Internalizers, they just keep quiet with anger. It just boils inside, and one day you realize they are gone. God you know, redeemed the one you knew. All right. You know, God, the Bible says in Ephesians, we're not talking about anybody here, but of course, friends, we in our home, we also deal with anger, and we're going to share with you some of them. The Bible actually has a command in Ephesians 2.26 that says, that shall not be angry. <laughs> of course, it doesn't say it like this. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. You know, are there good ways? We want to share, you are sharing with me seven uh, ways of resolving conflict. Is there, are there things we need to avoid when we are resolving conflicts? Yes, one of the things is don't attack the other person. And don't attack. How, yeah. what, is, what does it one mean to attack? One of the ways of attacking is when you say you always, you know, mm. you always do one, two, three things. You are the one you who is are wrong. You the one who is wrong. Mm. Nobody likes being told that uh -huh. they are wrong. Also, then you want to avoid being right, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, I just knew you were going to do this or being a mind reader as mm -hmm. such. Or being interruptive. We like, know the interruptive person. Like too. I usually interrupt. I'm still struggling with that one. <laughs> I, I really interrupt. But also blame game where you blame the other person, you blame the chicken, you blame the sunlight, you blame the chairs and every other thing. Mm -hmm. And then there's a guy who also has a problem with uh, number six. I don't know if you can talk number about number six. Number six is being mute. Mute. What is mute? You, know, you <laughs> give the silent treatment to someone who has angered you. Mm. You know, your girlfriend annoyed you and so you go disappear appearing for underground. weeks. You go underground. You go underground. You don't respond to texts. You don't respond to calls. Mm. But nobody knows that you are angry. And some people also get mad. So don't get mad when you are angry. Now, there are certain relationships that actually will uh, uh, really uh, stress you and we call them toxic relationships. Do you want to define for us toxic relationships? Toxic relationships are those that go against the will of God and does not help you to become a better person and realize your God-given purpose. Another way to define go a toxic relationship is the example of a relationship with sexual impurity. You, you know, are caught up in masturbation and uh, uh, premarital sex and adultery, and you are unequally yoked or you are codependent. And uh, you see, in this relationship, you will be drained emotionally. You will be provoked to anxiety. You're always crying, insecurity, blame, depression, ill. It inhibits your personal growth and it even reduces your freedom. You know, are there some reasons why people stay in toxic relationships? Yes, some people actually fear loneliness. Mm. You feel that if I leave this person, I'll never get another person. Others fear hurting the other person or fear the pain of just breaking up. They fear to break an engagement maybe because they don't know how or they have been threatened that if you break up, 
then you'll never get another person. Some people fear that, oh, now because I have a child, then I am worth a good relationship. They're all related to yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Others fear age, others fear starting a relationship, others fear to lose benefits. Somebody has been paying your rent, has been paying your fee, providing for your things. So how do I stop? Well, let's say it this way. If you're in a marriage, you want to pray over the issue and we want to handle that in a short while. But if it's just a relationship and you're still building because courtship is a place where you learn to know God's will. There are certain things that you may look at and you look at uh, the situation and say, this is so toxic. And you may want to make a decision. But before you make the decision, are there seven questions you need to ask before you make a decision to break up? We would want to take you through them. So one of the first questions is ask who is influencing your decision? Is mm. it God? Is it a friend who is jealous of your relationship? Yeah. Is it family? Or what exactly is influencing your decision? Mm. Then always address what is your part in the problem? Because wherever there are two people, there have been two additions to that problem. Have you done your best to save the relationship? And is the reason justifiable? That mm. means if this relationship was given to any other person, they would, they would do that. Yeah, if, so if that person is beating you up and you're not even married to mm -hmm. them, you may want to prayerfully consider. And then verse five, number five, actually. Do you know that there is no perfect relationship? Mm -hmm. So you don't leave the relationship seeking a perfect one because every relationship will have some imperfections. Don't leave the relationship because somebody sneezed. Exactly. All right, number then six. Have you honestly <laughs> prayed over the issue? And lastly, have you sought expert help concerning the matter and the counseling suppose you go through all this and you still realize you have to break up these are seven things you need to watch out during breakup don't break up on text or on social media single again you put your status that is not a breakup or and never lie about what is the reason don't make enemies explain the reason for the breakup and terminate the relationship terminate means it is over not in the evening you are again calling and texting have you eaten no 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 it is over terminate so that you can go on and after the breakup are there things you need to avoid yes don't revenge uh -huh. yeah then don't talk. What's don't stalking? Go. Stalking means you're on WhatsApp checking who, I wonder who he's talking to now. I wonder now. Who, where is quarantine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you go on his Facebook and check whose status did he like uh -huh. now. Yeah. Then also don't rush into another relationship. Don't badmouth your ex because it shows that you are also wrong because your ex was actually part of your was decisions. Was one of your choices. Exactly. Yeah. Don't lose your head. And don't be angry and you now start, you know, breaking glasses. Yeah, you now don't go to work, you don't show charge. up in church, mm. yeah. And don't wallow in self-pity. Also, don't give up on love. We need to give you more points on how to handle conflict, you know. Uh, when there's a conflict in the home, you want to pray about the issue. Not only that, you want to be considerate. Philippians 2 verse 4 says, not every man on his own things. Don't look at just your own things, but also look on the things of the other. So, and then remain calm. Proverbs 17 verse 27, you can write that. He that hath knowledge spares his words, and a man of understanding is of a calm spirit. And also admit your fault. You know, some people never have a fault in any conflict. And focus on the problem. Focus on the problem, especially ladies, and pardon. Pardon. And when you are going to pardon, let's say you want to give somebody a second chance, you need to consider s certain things. Now, if you are to go back to a relationship, you want to consider the length of the breakup. What was the reason for the breakup? What are the underlying factors that are causing you to reconcile now? What's the motivation to reunite? And what is the condition? Then, then are you willing yeah, to forgive? That's and an important. Be willing to forgive, even if not going back to the yeah. relationship. Yeah, and also we talk about the way forward. And that's why we want to leave with you as we come to the close. We want to leave with you some thoughts on forgiveness because families get strained. And sometimes maybe I did for you something wrong, but when we reconcile, I would say something like, I promise I won't bring this up or use it against you in future. I will not dwell on it in my mind or in my heart. I'm not going to talk to other people about it. That's a way of clearing it out. I'm not going to let it stand between 
between us and hinder our personal relationship. So when you forgive, the Bible has this good promise in Ephesians 4.32. You want to read it for us? It says, and be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, mm -hmm. forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven, has forgiven you. you. And you know, friends, here are some thoughts about forgiveness we want to leave you with. Until you let your past to die, it won't let your future to live. There's another one you want to read that? Forgiveness doesn't make it right. It just makes us free. Ah, those are good thoughts. And then there is one more here. Forgiveness doesn't excuse their behavior. It just prevents their behavior from destroying your heart. That's an important one. And then there is one more. I wanted to read this one. You can't reach for anything new if your hands are full of yesterday's junk. And the last one, forgiveness does not change your past, but it surely does enlarge your future. And the Bible says that even if you've lost time in a relationship, God says, I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten. And not only that, why the word of God comes to you into your house? Because God, whenever he sends his word, he wants to heal us. Read for us that promise in Psalms 107 Psalms verse 20. Psalms 107 verse 20 says, He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. So we want to leave you today with those words and those thoughts that you would rebuild your relationship. Those skills, you can rewatch these things, post at some point where we gave too many points if we went too fast. But today, I can't help but just think about a melody of love in my heart. Here's a song that can cheer your house uh, this evening. You can sing along with us. It says, I have a song that Jesus gave me, and it's a melody of love. We sang this song in our wedding. I still remember. It was a good song. We can still sing it again today as we close this broadcast. Melody of Love. What a song. Go to your friend today who maybe you are estranged and reach out to them. Try to solve the issue. Pray together and pray that God will reach out to all families and bind them together. song. Can you sing it now? I have a song that Jesus gave me. It was sent from heaven above. There never was a sweeter melody. Tis the melody of love. In my heart there rings a melody. There rings a melody with heaven's song. Sing number two. I love the Christ who died on Calvary, right. for he washed my sins away. He put within my heart a melody, and I know it's there to S-T-A-Y. What's that, S-T-A-Y? Stay. Stay. To stay? Yes. You messed up the song. <laughs> like always. You always mess up this part. But I would like you to sing it again. I love the Christ who died on Calvary. Sing it. I love the Christ who died on Calvary. For he washed my sins away. He put within my heart a melody. And I know it's there to stay. In my heart there rings the melody. There rings a melody. With heaven's harmony In my heart there rings a melody There rings a melody of love To be my endless theme with the angels I will sing To be a song with glorious 
harmony when the chords of heaven ring. They'll ring now in my heart. There rings a melody. There rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart, there rings a melody. There rings a melody of love. I want you to collect all your household and let's sing together that chorus. It says, In my heart, there rings a melody. There rings a melody with heaven's harmony. Sing it. In my heart, there rings a melody. There rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart, there rings a melody. There rings a melody of love. In my heart, there rings a melody. There rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart, there rings a melody. There rings a melody of love. 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 You know, friends, God sets the lonely, the solitary in families. We pray that God will strengthen and rebuild your homes. Let us pause as we pray to close this broadcast. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening, for the insights you've given us on the benefits of love and how you want us to run our homes, how you want us to set them up on your word. We pray, Lord, that when there is division, when there is a difference of thought, the difference of thought that your heart will touch ours, that we will be reconcilable to each other. We pray that this melody of love will be in every home, that everyone will be reconciled to their brethren and will live happily and in unity. May your power restore and rebuild our homes, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.